afternoon, everyone. My name is John Bonifaz. I am the co-founder and president of Free Speech for People. Free Speech for People is a national, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization launched on the day of the Supreme Court Citizens United ruling more than eight years ago and dedicated to defending our Constitution and reclaiming our democracy. For the past 18 months, we have been co-leading a campaign calling for impeachment proceedings against President Trump based on his repeated and egregious abuses of power. More than 1.3 million Americans across the country have joined this campaign and it is backed by a legal advisory board of prominent constitutional scholars across the country. We are proud today to be joining with the Need to Impeach campaign for this panel discussion on the legal grounds for impeachment proceedings against President Trump. Free Speech for People is also proud to be announcing today the upcoming release of our new book, The Constitution Demands It, The Case for the Impeachment of Donald Trump, authored by our legal director, Ron Fine, our board chair, Ben Clements, and myself. The book will be published by Melville House and released on August 14th of this year. You can learn more about this book and pre-order it at our new site, impeachmentproject.org. I will introduce our panelists in the order in which they will be speaking. Following their opening remarks, I will facilitate a dialogue among the panelists. Tom Steyer, one of our panelists, will then make some closing remarks. First, we will hear from Ron Fine, furthest to my right. Mr. Fine is the legal director of Free Speech for People, where he oversees the organization's legal advocacy program. Mr. Fine previously served as assistant regional counsel in the United States Environmental Protection Agency's New England office, where he received the EPA's National Gold Medal for exceptional service. Mr. Fine previously clerked for the Honorable Kermit Lippez of the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit and the Honorable Douglas Woodlock of the United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts. Mr. Fine is a graduate of Stanford Law School. Mr. Fine will discuss the standards and process for impeachment and will summarize our legal grounds for impeachment proceedings against President Trump. Next, we will hear from Jennifer Taub, to my left, a professor of law at Vermont Law School and a member of Free Speech for People's Board of Directors. Professor Taub researches and writes in the areas of corporate governance, financial market reform, securities regulation, and white collar crime. She has testified as an expert before the United States Senate Banking Committee and the United States House Financial Services Subcommittee concerning banking and financial reform related matters. Mm -hmm. Professor Taub's first book, Other People's Houses, How Decades of Bailouts, Captive Regulators, and Toxic Bankers Made Home Mortgages a Thrilling Business, was published in May 2014 by Yale University Press. She is also the co-author with the late Kathleen Brickey of Corporate and White Collar Crime, Cases and Materials, Sixth Edition, published in 2017 by Walters Kluwer. In addition to the book, Other People's Houses, Professor Taub has written extensively on the financial crisis. Prior to joining academia, Professor Taub was an associate general counsel with Fidelity Investments. She is a graduate of Harvard Law School. Professor Taub will address corruption and the president's businesses, discuss the president's ongoing violations of the foreign and domestic emoluments clauses of the U.S. Constitution. We will then hear from Ben Clements, uh, furthest to my left, the chair of the Board of Free Speech for People, as well as the chair of the board's legal committee. Mr. Clements is a former federal prosecutor and a former chief legal counsel for Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick. He is a founding partner of the Boston law firm Clements & Pino, LLP, representing persons and entities in white collar criminal proceedings, state and federal enforcement proceedings, complex business litigation and appeals, and providing advice in connection with political campaigns, government ethics, and related areas. His clients have included business executives and professionals, senior government officials, Fortune 500 companies, small businesses, nonprofit institutions, and state and federal governments. Mr. Clements previously served as the chair of the Massachusetts Governor's Task Force on Public Integrity, a bipartisan committee that led to landmark legislation 
overhauling the state's ethics, lobbying, and campaign finance laws. Mr. Clements is a graduate of Cornell Law School. Mr. Clements will discuss the legal ground of obstruction of justice for impeachment proceedings, and he will address why there is sufficient basis for Congress to proceed with the impeachment process now without waiting for Special Counsel Robert Mueller to complete his federal criminal investigation. Our closing panelist is Tom Steyer, to my right. Mr. Steyer is a progressive activist, philanthropist, and environmentalist who believes we have a moral responsibility to ensure that all Americans have equal access to economic opportunity, education, and a healthy climate. Mr. Steyer is the president and founder of Next Gen America and Need to Impeach. Mr. Steyer launched the Need to Impeach campaign on October 20, 2017, through national television and social media ads. More than 5.4 million people have since signed on to support the campaign. So far, 13 national commercials, including two in Spanish, have aired, reaching more than 2 billion television viewers and more than 454 million people through social media. Mr. Steyer will discuss the Need to Impeach campaign and why Americans across the country are calling for impeachment proceedings to move forward now. We will start with Ron Fine. Thank you. I'm going to first start by talking about the constitutional standards for impeachment and the process, and then I'll briefly summarize the grounds that we have identified for the House of Representatives to begin committee hearings on whether to impeach the president. The Constitution provides that the president and other federal officials shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. The phrase high crimes and misdemeanors isn't defined in the Constitution, but the founders knew it from England. It means offenses committed against the state by public officials. Contrary to a common misconception, high crimes and misdemeanors do not need to be violations of federal criminal statutes. This is explained in detail in our forthcoming book, and it is widely accepted by leading constitutional scholars. In fact, in the constitutional debates in 1787 and 1788, when the framers of the Constitution gave examples of grounds for impeaching the president, such as receiving emoluments from foreign governments, they often gave such examples that didn't violate any criminal law then and still don't. Furthermore, we have two centuries of precedent from Congress itself, which has conducted impeachment proceedings against three presidents and more than 60 other uh, officials, mostly judges, often for non-criminal conduct. And in fact, fewer than a third of the impeachments issued by the House of Representatives to date have specifically invoked a criminal statute or even used the word crime. So the procedures for impeachment come partly from the Constitution and partly from Congress's rules. The first step is usually that the House Judiciary Committee conducts hearings to investigate the charges. Then the committee votes on whether to recommend articles of impeachment to the full House of Representatives. At this point or later, officials often resign. For example, it was at this point in 1974 that President Nixon resigned. If the full House approves the articles of impeachment by a majority vote, which it has done 19 times in our history against two presidents, 15 judges, and two other officials, the next step is a trial before the Senate. And if two-thirds of the senators vote to convict, then the president is removed from office. Now I'll summarize only briefly the grounds for congressional impeachment investigations that we've identified. Some of these grounds are based on violations of specific constitutional or statutory provisions. Other abuses of power don't correspond to a specific textual provision, but they nonetheless meet the high bar for impeachment. For now, I can only provide a brief summary. Our book lays these out in detail, both the facts and the legal arguments for why these offenses are grounds for impeachment. The first ground for impeachment hearings is accepting unconstitutional foreign and domestic government emoluments. Trump had been warned before the inauguration that he would need to separate himself from his businesses, but he chose to ignore that advice. And because he continues to profit from foreign governments, the federal government, and even state and local governments, he's been violating the Constitution's Foreign Emoluments Clause and its Domestic Emoluments Clause since day one. And the founders specifically cited this as an example of an impeachable offense. 
The second ground is conspiring to solicit and then conceal illegal foreign assistance for his presidential campaign. Now, we know that senior campaign officials, Trump's campaign manager, his son, and his son-in-law, and probably Trump himself, actively participated in soliciting campaign help from Russian nationals whom they understood to be foreign government agents. We don't yet know the full extent of Trump's personal involvement in soliciting that help, but we do know that Trump helped cover it up. This all violated federal campaign finance law, but more importantly, the founders specifically cited corrupting the presidential election via foreign intrigue as an example of an impeachable offense. Third, obstructing justice. Since his first week in office, Trump has repeatedly tried to interfere with federal investigations into the conduct of himself and of his subordinates. That is obstruction of justice, conduct intended to frustrate or impede an investigation. The key question here is not whether Trump violated some of the specific federal criminal statutes that fall under the heading of obstruction of justice. He probably did. But Congress can take a broader view in an impeachment proceeding than a federal court could in a criminal trial. And this, again, was a major part of the articles of impeachment against President Richard Nixon. Fourth, directing law enforcement to investigate and prosecute critics and political adversaries for improper purposes. Trump views federal law enforcement, the Department of Justice, and other agencies as a weapon to be turned against his political adversaries. And he's directed these agencies to harass and prosecute his critics. That's a dangerous threat to the rule of law. And it was also part of the articles of impeachment against President Richard Nixon. Fifth, abusing the pardon power. The president has the power to pardon crimes. And all presidents have issued a controversial pardon or two. But in his very first pardon, a former Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio, Trump crossed a line that had never before been breached in our entire history. The Arpaio pardon was the first time that any president in our history issued a pardon for criminal contempt of court, for violating an injunction issued to a government official to stop a systemic practice of violating individuals' constitutional rights. That abuses the pardon power because it undermines due process and the rule of law. Courts can't protect individual rights if government officials can violate injunctions with impunity. The founders and later the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court specifically cited abuse of the pardon power as an example of an impeachable offense. The sixth ground is advocating illegal violence and undermining equal protection of the laws. In 2016, Trump often used dangerous race baiting, race baiting rhetoric and urged crowds to beat up protesters. Since taking office, he's continued. He's urged police to be rough with suspects. He's given aid and comfort to white supremacists. And he suggested that the military should commit war crimes against Muslims. This pattern of conduct violates the president's obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, to protect the citizenry against domestic violence, and to ensure the equal protection of the laws. Worse yet, studies have shown that Trump's rhetoric has had a real negative effect in terms of increased racist incidents and violence in our schools and communities. The seventh ground is reckless endangerment by threatening nuclear war. Trump has crossed the line between calculated strategic or tactical risks and reckless endangerment likely to cause millions of deaths by issuing nuclear threats against North Korea without considering or likely even understanding the consequences. In the military, reckless endangerment is a court-martial offense that can land a soldier in the brig for something like failure to properly inspect parachute riggings. Recklessly threatening nuclear war is far more serious especially given that Trump's own staff doubt that he has the capacity to make informed decisions. The eighth ground is undermining the freedom of the press. Strongman leaders have discovered in countries that are spiraling from democracy into autocracy, an authoritarian president can undermine the freedom of the press even without formal censorship. Trump is taking us down that path. And it's not just the tweets about fake news. He's also tried to use the power of the government to punish the press for criticism. We recently added a ninth ground, cruel and unconstitutional imprisonment of children and their families. Trump's treatment of migrant families, migrant children, shocks the conscience and violates the Fifth Amendment's due process clause and the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishments. On the surface, Trump's conduct here may not resemble the types of textbook impeachable offenses that involve a, a rogue president acting alone in the Oval Office or with a small group of henchmen. In this case, Trump has openly embroiled massive federal agencies in his unconstitutional activity. 
but it would be perverse to say that the president could be impeached for running a scheme out of the Oval Office, but not for directing a policy through the government under his command. Now, some of these abuses overlap with Special Counsel Robert Mueller's criminal investigation. Others don't. Some are well established in our history from the debates in 1787 or from Congress's past impeachments. Others are unprecedented precisely because no precedent has trampled these lines before. All of these are high crimes and misdemeanors because they undermine the rule of law, subvert our constitutional democracy, and put us in grave danger of the type that the founders would have recognized. There is still time for us to recover from the damage that Trump has done to the republic, but the window may be closing. Congress must act now. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Our next speaker will be Professor Jennifer Topp. Good afternoon, um, everyone here and um, at home or at work. Thank you for joining us. As John mentioned earlier, uh, my name is Jennifer Taub, and I'm a professor at Vermont Law School, uh, where I teach business law courses, including in financial market regulation and white-collar crime. My work often focuses on the importance of full and fair disclosure in efforts to combat fraud and corruption. The famous phrase from Watergate, follow the money, is my mantra. I offer my remarks today solely as an academic and not on behalf of my law school or any other organization with which I'm associated. Today I will discuss why Congress needs to investigate whether the President has been violating the Constitution's emolument spans since the moment he took office. But before I do that, I want to address an issue that must be at the forefront of your minds. Why now? Why should the House begin impeachment investigation now? Why shouldn't they just wait until Robert Mueller finishes his work? To begin answering this question, it helps to revisit the scope of the special counsel investigation. While Mueller's mandate is quite broad, it is not unlimited. He is investigating whether Donald Trump's presidential campaign coordinated with the Russian government to interfere in our 2016 presidential election. Plus, he's also authorized to investigate and prosecute other federal crimes that arise during the course of the investigation, things like money laundering. And finally, his power also includes prosecuting anyone who intentionally interferes with the investigation. Here, think perjury, false statements, destruction of evidence, obstruction of justice, and witness tampering as a few examples. But notably absent from this list are high crimes and misdemeanors that are impeachable offenses, but not federal statutory offenses. So this would include violation of the foreign and domestic emoluments bans of the U.S. Constitution. The founders intended these to be impeachable offenses, yet they are not federal felonies. As an aside, there are federal crimes, like obstruction of justice, for which there, there is an impeachable analog that requires different levels of proof. So in other words, regarding these emolument clause violations, no matter how long we wait, Mueller will never get to these. And regarding high crimes and misdemeanors like obstruction of justice, Congress has the right and the obligation to pursue these independently of the special counsel criminal investigation. So let's focus on these emoluments clauses. These are two anti-corruption provisions in the United States Constitution. The purpose is, their purpose is to ensure that the president faithfully serves the people, free from inducements from foreign governments, individual states, or other parts of the federal government. So first, the foreign emoluments ban, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 8. What this says in plain language is this. In the absence of congressional approval, the president may not accept any present or payment whatsoever from foreign governments and officials. It derives from the Articles of Confederation and was modeled after a 1651 Dutch rule. Edmund Jennings Randolph at the Virginia Ratifying Convention for the Constitution said that if the president is discovered violating the Foreign Emoluments Clause, quote, he may be impeached. Also, as uh, the book points out, the founders wanted to prevent foreign influence and corruption. The concern was that financial dependence and business interests could impact a president's foreign policy decisions. The word emolument is meant to cover any financial benefit. So this would include, for example, even an ordinary fair market transaction. 
thinking about the Trump uh, family uh, business, this could include lease payments on buildings, room reservations, rebroadcasts of programs, and other similar business ties uh, from which money will flow to the president from foreign governments. So I'd like to provide some concrete examples um, that appear in the new book. Um, more than 100 Trump companies do or have done business in 18 countries and territories around the world. The largest emoluments magnet is the Trump International Hotel in Washington, D.C., and it's received numerous foreign payments. Uh, for example, um, according to the book, um, at the embassy of Kuwait was actively pressured to change an existing reservation by the Trump Organization. So initially, they just canceled the event, but then this year, Kuwait held its National Day of Celebration at the Trump International Hotel in D.C. In June of this year, just last month, um, the, the Philippine Embassy held its 120th Independence Day celebration where? At Trump's hotel. Last year in May, Turkey's Foreign Economic Relations Board co-sponsored a conference at the hotel. I mean, I could go on and on. I'm going to try to keep it short, but you get, you get the idea. What's so interesting is it really does seem like it's more than just payments and presents. One wonders whether under it all there's even quid pro quo. Uh, for example, in late October 2017, Mexico's former ambassador to the U.S. reported that he learned from a former U.S. diplomat that the U.S. State Department's official protocol now emphasizes to world leaders that they should use Trump's D.C. hotel for official visits. It's not just that hotel. Foreign governments also spend money in Trump's other U.S. properties, and at least two entity, entities controlled by foreign governments are paying rent or fees at Trump's building. One example is in Trump Tower, which is Trump's flagship skyscraper at 725 Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. One of the largest tenants is the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, and this bank is controlled by the Chinese government, and the bank leases the entire 20th floor. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia actually owns the 40 fifth floor of world, a Trump World Tower, which is in the UN Plaza, another Trump building. And the kingdom pays annual building and amenity charges. We don't know how much, but back in 2001, it was more than $85,000 per year. Um, and this, um, in, in last September, the Trump National Golf Club in Northern Virginia hosted the Turkish Airlines World Golf Cup, sponsored by the state-owned Turkish Airlines. But this goes more, uh, more than rent in properties, it involves foreign um, entities extending credit, foreign trademark approvals, foreign government permits and approvals from countries including India, Indonesia, the Philippines, Turkey, UAE, and the United Kingdom. You may have heard that recently the Trump Organization sent a $151,000 check uh, to Treasury claiming that this would solve uh, the emoluments problems. There are a number of reasons why it doesn't. First, as, as mentioned, foreign emoluments can only um, be accepted with congressional approval. And secondly, there was no accounting when this check was mailed. Um, the, the claim was that it represented profits from foreign businesses at hotels and similar enterprises, um, but it was said to be an estimate and not a calculation. Not only is this not in line with the constitutional mandate, but if you just think about the recent civil lawsuit brought by the state attorney general against Trump involving his charitable um, organization, we simply cannot trust that even pre-profit payments were not made um, illicitly um, and, and payments passed along to um, Trump in violation of the Constitution. In addition to the foreign emoluments ban, there's also a domestic emoluments ban. This is sometimes called the Presidential Salary Clause, and this is found in Article 2, Section 1, Clause 1. And this provides, again, in plain language, um, an outright prohibition on the president receiving any payments from the U.S. government or the states beyond his official salary. So, for example, when the president uses his position as president to attract private club members and increase the membership of, at Mar-a-Lago from 100,000 to 200,000 a year. Um, that would be one example. Also maintaining the lease on the U.S. government-owned building that houses the Trump International Hotel in D.C. He, um, there's additional uh, ways in which he's violating um, the clause. This includes subsidies and tax breaks and other direct and indirect payments. So in conclusion, some of the conduct that I've described um, here and as described in the book, 
overlaps with the criminal investigation uh, by Special Counsel Robert Mueller. And some of this conduct also overlaps with pending federal civil litigation regarding emoluments, but some has no other parallel procedure. What's important, though, is that an impeachment investigation is entirely separate from a criminal or other judicial proceeding. The purpose of impeachment is not to punish for offenses, but to remove from office an official who threatens the rule of law. Congress must not use a special counsel investigation or any other legal case as an excuse to dodge its obligation to conduct an independent impeachment investigation. The abuse of power, the corruption, and the threat to our republic are here now. Now is the time to act. Thank you, Professor Taub. Our next speaker will be Ben Clements. Thank you, John. Thank you to all of you for being here today, and thanks to those watching live. Um, as Professor Taub's excellent presentation illustrates, this is a presidency that is obsessed, obsessed with profit. Profit for Donald Trump, profit for his family. Uh, e even for someone inclined to read or listen, it would be difficult to learn about the issues affecting the country, putting that much of your efforts into using the presidency to enrich yourself. But as much as he has been obsessed with that, there is one other obsession that has competed for his time and his energy throughout his presidency, and that has been the obsession with doing everything he can to shut down, to impede, to interfere with the investigation into his and his campaign's unlawful participation with the Russians' efforts to tilt the 2016 election in his favor. From his earliest days in January 2017 in office, when he began uh, his efforts to enforce loyalty from the head of the FBI, Jim Comey, who was then overseeing the investigation, to his efforts to convince Comey to drop the investigation, to his firing of Jim Comey when he couldn't get Comey to comply, to his continuous efforts to threaten anyone with authority over the investigation with firing, with removal, to dangling the hope of a pardon to anybody who might be a witness against him, and to the constant smearing, the undermining of the special counsel now running the Russia investigation. Barely a day has gone by where Donald Trump has not committed obstruction of justice. This, along with profit, is the dominant feature of the Trump presidency. And so along with this parade of obstruction, you've heard about eight other separate categories of impeachable offenses uh, from Ron Fine and Professor Taub. Um, any one of these would have long ago resulted in impeachment proceedings against any other president. Any one of them. And yet, here we are, 18 months in, and with the exception of 16 patriotic members of Congress who have sponsored articles of impeachment, there is a constant and uniform refrain from members of Congress, from leadership, from the entire political media establishment that this is not the time to even talk about impeachment, let alone begin impeachment hearings. We have found ourselves in a toxic combination of Republican mendacity and Democratic cowardice that results in a unified bipartisan message. It's too soon to impeach. They say the evidence is not there yet. The facts are not in yet. We can't impeach over policy or political differences. Now, these kinds of evasions, they would be laughable in the face of what you've heard today if they weren't so dangerous. The, we're not talking here about political differences. We're certainly not talking about policy differences. We are talking about core, clear-cut impeachable offenses. These are not borderline situations that could be debated. These are clear-cut impeachable offenses that have affected every aspect of this presidency. Uh, as Ron Fine mentioned, the attempt 
to enlist a foreign power to interfere with an election is itself something that the framers recognize as an impeachable uh, offense. The emoluments violations that you've heard about in great detail were specifically discussed by the framers of the Constitution, and they recognized that the taking of foreign emoluments or domestic emoluments would be an impeachable offense. Obstruction of justice, equally well recognized as an impeachable offense, most famously the lead ground for the articles of impeachment uh, against President Nixon. And it certainly would come as a surprise to the framers that we could be debating whether firing the head of the FBI to thwart an investigation into the president is impeachable. The framers believed, in the words of James Madison, that the wanton removal of meritorious officers was itself an impeachable offense. Fully uh, one-third of the impeachments that Congress has carried out have involved financial impropriety. And this president has engaged in financial impropriety of self-enrichment from his office on a scale never before seen in the history of the country. It's unquestionably these financial uh, enrichments that you've heard about from Professor Taub are by themselves impeachable. Abuse of the pardon power, also specifically recognized by the framers as an impeachable offense. More recently, in one of the few Supreme Court cases ever to discuss the par pardon power, the Supreme Court recognized that an abuse of the pardon power would be uh, impeachable. The misuse of federal law enforcement offices to go after the president's political enemies, also clear-cut impeachable conduct. Again, one of the grounds for the impeachment articles against Richard Nixon. The other areas that we've talked about have less clear historic precedent. That is not because they are not clear abuses of power subject to impeachment. It's because we have never before had a president this lawless and this contemptuous of the Constitution willing to push the envelope this far into autocracy. And still, the lead refrain you hear from the anti-impeachment crowd is, we have to wait for special counsel Mueller's investigation to be completed. We need to hear what the special counsel has to say. This has become the go-to excuse for Congress not doing their job. And Professor Taub has touched upon this a little bit already, but let me just outline some of, not all, but some of the many reasons why that excuse uh, is baseless, why Congress cannot use that as a reason not to pursue an impeachment investigation, and they're abdicating their responsibilities in doing that. First of all, uh, as broad as some people have tried to portray the Mueller investigation, it is in many respects very limited. It's primarily focused on Russian interference in the election and obstruction of justice. That covers two of the nine grounds for impeachment we have discussed here. The others, the emoluments violations, uh, recklessly courting nuclear war, undermining the First Amendment, abuse of the pardon power, and so on. None of those are within the jurisdiction of Robert Mueller. And any one of those, and certainly all of them collectively, would be enough to justify an impeachment investigation, putting aside obstruction and putting aside uh, the Russian interference in the election. Second of all, uh, Mueller's investigation is strictly limited to finding out whether any federal criminal statutory offenses have occurred. But as you have heard, there is not complete overlap between criminal conduct and impeachable conduct. Uh, many abuses of power, and certainly many that the president uh, is engaged in, do not involve criminal activity. Uh, in fact, the majority of impeachment proceedings brought by Congress have not invoked any criminal vi violation. Um, third, the evidence, publicly available evidence, that you've all read about in the newspapers that we see on a daily basis, we, we see the president commit impeachable offenses before our eyes on national television. The evidence is public, it's overwhelming, it's not debatable, and so there's no reason for Congress to wait. It does not need more. Lastly, and most importantly, we as a people, we as a nation, we cannot afford 
to wait to see what happens with Mueller's investigation. By all indications, he is moving forward deliberately, thoroughly, and at a quick pace, much quicker than special counsel investigations of the past. He has produced uh, 17 separate indictments, five separate guilty pleas. But there's no indication other than some self-serving statements by Rudy Giuliani <laughs> that this investigation is wrapping up soon. Uh, and in the meantime, he, Mueller and his investigation is being undermined on a daily basis by this president and his minions. Any conclusions that he ultimately reach, reaches will be undermined already by the damage the president is doing. And in the meantime, the damage that the president is doing to our democracy, to our constitutional order, to the fabric of our nation is growing by the day. Only time will tell how many major catastrophes he has already inflicted upon us. Make no mistake, we are now witnessing a major catastrophe at the border as this president is ripping migrant families apart and sticking children in cages. And this is not the only one. There are more that will come out and there are more that will be inflicted upon us the longer he is left in office. It is time for Congress, it is time for Democrats and Republicans alike to put country above party, to put principle and the Constitution above politics. It is time for an impeachment investigation now. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Our, our final speaker will be Tom Steyer. Good afternoon. I would like to thank uh, Professor Taub, Ben Clements, Ron Fine, and John Boniface for making me seem moderate. <laughs> Very relaxing to be here amongst you in the afternoon and realize that in this group I really am a moderate, and I'm the only one here without a law degree. So you'd think that uh, actually they'd be much more careful than I am. So uh, what I'd like to talk for a second as a non-lawyer is why what you've just heard matters so much. And this is, we did this panel I think back in December, because the first question that everybody asks us about impeachment is whether there's a smoking gun. Everybody says, I understand that he's a terrible president, that he makes me furious, he does all these bad things, but is there a smoking gun that legally puts him beyond the criteria of impeachment? And I thought that when we did this panel in December, it was very much of a laydown. And I feel that updating it in July is incredibly appropriate. And I'm very grateful to what we heard today because it is such a laydown. And I know that we'll put this on the web. I'm sure John will put this on the web. But, and I'm sure their book will be really helpful. And I intend to, intend to send several early Christmas presents to people who are wondering whether or not there's a smoking gun. But I think we should also put in the context of the United States where this legal argument falls and why it's so important. Because at this point, 42% of Americans want this president impeached and removed from office. In March of 1974, Nixon left in August. In March of 1974, 43% of Americans wanted impeached and removed from office. This is an educational process for the American people. I would say very few Americans know what the word emoluments means. Very few. I think virtually no Americans are aware of what the charge is for Mr. Mueller and his investigation and the difference between an impeachable offense and a criminal violation. So there, is an ar there are arguments here that are absolutely critical on an educational basis for Americans to know what's going on. What we can see, both in terms of the number of sign-ups that we have on our petition, which if you haven't signed, please do, um, what we can see from the polling data, but also what we can see when we go around the country and talk to people is that people are very upset about this. What you're hearing here is an informed rationale about, about why people's natural upset is actually responsible and thoughtful. And that's what people need to hear is that there are facts that are not, that are verifiable that go way beyond the right to impeach. 
The second question is about the urgency that in particular Ben was discussing. And let me say this, we've done a similar panel with psychologists and psychiatrists who say this president is a malignant narcissist who is deteriorating. And they say every despot in history has had a similar personality type that what we're seeing from an urgency standpoint, if you don't like today, wait till tomorrow. And if you don't like tomorrow, the next day will be worse. A rock is only going to run downhill. And that's the same thing about this president and this presidency, that what we're seeing right now is the best we're going to see. So that's one point. Second point, I think Ben alluded to this, but I was down at the border with Catholic Relief Services and the nun who was running the program to provide aid and succor to the families and the children said that the separation of children from their parents and specifically their mothers fits the international definition of torture. So what we are doing is officially torturing children to try to extort their parents to give up their right for asylum. An amazing fact in the United States of America. And the last point I would make is this in terms of urgency. We have a president who is insisting on meeting personally with the head of a country that hacked our last election, that the FBI said is trying to hack this election, and the president wants to do it without any American witnesses so that no one can say what goes on. An amazing and threatening fact in terms of the safety of the American people and the safety of the American democracy. And the last thing I'll say in terms of urgency is his pick of Mr. Kavanaugh to be the ninth Supreme Court Justice, a man who has said that the president should not be subject to criminal prosecution, which, by the way, is what the Mueller investigation is. So he's saying the only response appropriate, believe it or not, I will take this as a personal compliment and a compliment to everyone on this panel, is impeachment. But of course, in the current situation with Republicans shutting down investigations in both the House and the Senate, the idea of an impeachment is an impossibility. So the president has chosen someone who's on the record that he believes we should shut down any investigation, any criminal investigation that touches the president. He doesn't have to respond to subpoenas. He doesn't have to respond to any request for information, period, until he's out of office. So I would say this, it is what these guys have said is incredibly important in terms of educating people, particularly about the, for the right for this to happen. Because the real question that we hear all the time in town halls is, yes, it's bad, but can you show us that in fact the evidence is in, don't we have to wait for Mueller? That is actually the pushback not just from the elites in Washington, D.C., who don't want to deal with this, but from people who are taking their cues from those elites. And so this panel, I really would like to thank all the people on this panel and you for showing up in, the, in a warm afternoon to say this is an incredibly important patriotic moment. And we will either succeed in this or we will rue the day that we don't succeed. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we have some time for dialogue among the panelists. I'm going to start with a question to Ron, but others should jump in, uh, which is building off of Tom's point about the Supreme Court nomination. Ron, what impact should these grounds for impeachment proceedings have on the nomination or confirmation process of the president's Supreme Court nominee? Well, we have never before had a situation where a president who was under criminal investigation or facing impeachment proceedings nominated a Supreme Court justice while that was happening. Uh, president Nixon nominated four Supreme Court justices, but that was well before the Watergate break-in even happened. Uh, president Clinton uh, appointed two, again, before Monica Lewinsky even began her internship at the White House. So this is actually uncharted territory, but because Trump is facing both criminal prosecution and larger impeachment proceedings, there are many questions that could come before the Supreme Court in the next few years that will affect uh, Trump personally, his, his personal liberty, his, his office. And it's unthinkable that a judge who just a few years ago wrote about how he thought a sitting president uh, shouldn't be able to be indicted and has expressed uh, his thoughts on these types of issues would be the one who would be deciding these very issues
that the, the president is going to be facing. And there are many scenarios that will come up. Can and some of them involve the criminal prosecution? Can the special counsel subpoena testimony from the president? Um, can he, uh, can the president, of course, be indicted? There are even questions that could come up within impeachment processes if the president were to try and go to the courts to fight off an impeachment proceeding in Congress. So I think the answer is that the president should not be able to appoint a Supreme Court justice under this cloud and that the Senate should put confirmation hearings on hold until criminal investigations and impeachment proceedings have concluded. Uh, Jennifer, you wanted to jump in on this? Yeah, I, I, I want to get into the weeds a little bit with you on this law review article that, the, that Brett Kavanaugh wrote only because, uh, and I, before I get into them, there are some folks who are saying, wait, read it a little more closely um, and, you, and, and trying to sort of lull us into a sense of security. So let me highlight what people are trying to say that seem to make what he's saying better and, and then kind of discuss this with you a bit about why I don't think it does. So apparently in, in the, in the um, his focus in the article when he says that a president shouldn't be burdened um, with criminal proceedings or even civil proceedings um, or shouldn't be indicted while he's in office, he suggests that Congress enact a law to prevent that. And so some people are saying, oh, see, what this means is, based on this article, assuming he still stands by it, that he believes um, that it would take an act of Congress to stop that. So that, on the one hand, maybe sounds good. On the other hand, First, this was just a law review article. But secondly, there are other, his, there are other issues that go to um, presidential power and autonomy that are likely to come up well before that. Things like the self-pardon issue. He's never spoken to that. Um, there are other, other types of issues. So I just want to throw that back to you, Ron, and tell me if you feel somehow mollified by the fact that in this law journal article he was suggesting that you would need an act of Congress. We don't know what conversations the president had with Judge Kavanaugh as part of the, the vetting process. We do know that uh, it's been reported on CNN that the president's vetting team did look at that law review article uh, closely. And we know that Trump personally interviewed the top federal prosecutor in Manhattan, which is, uh, there's nothing illegal about that, but it's uh, unprecedented that the president would be personally interviewing any U.S. attorney, and in particular, the one in Manhattan is the one who is, uh, has criminal jurisdiction over Trump and his businesses and many of his associates. So we don't know exactly how far Brett Kavanaugh would or wouldn't go uh, on the Supreme Court. Certainly, there's plenty of evidence that judges in the past who felt constrained by certain things when they were on the lower courts, once they get to the Supreme Court, their, their true colors emerge. So I think that uh, regardless of what arguments could be made that the, the Law Review article was only taking a certain narrow angle, I think the risk of, of any nominee, and especially this one, um, is, is too great. Then the Senate can put confirmation on hold. It doesn't mean that, uh, that you know, Kavanaugh has to go away, but it can pause the process and wait until all these proceedings have resolved. Ben or Tom, do you want to weigh in on this? Well, I'll just reemphasize the very last point Ron made, which is, um, you know, we, we can all try to read the tea leaves of what a Justice Kavanaugh might do, but the point is any Supreme Court justice chosen by this president at this particular time, particularly given his track record of trying to exercise his will over his appointees, is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, and the Senate absolutely needs to put any confirmation hearings on hold, at least uh, until after the Mueller investigation. Although my view, I believe our view collectively, is they need to be on hold until an impeachment investigation is not just begun, but completed. So I, I would just like to point out something that my friend Ron Fine uh, showed me recently, which was that in 1610, I'll just give you the Latin because I know that you're all <laughs> fluent. <laughs> Uh, it was said that you cannot be a judge in your own trial. Mm -hmm. 1610. And the, the, the real question about appointing a Supreme Court justice at this point is, aren't you, in effect, by extension, becoming a judge in your own trial? And isn't that really what the president is trying to do? Great. Thank you. So another question that's come up around these issues of calls for impeachment proceedings is, isn't this really political, partisan, grandstanding. Uh, so Tom, I, I want to start with you on that. How do you address that charge? So 
when we think about impeachment and every time a Washington insider tells us to stand down, um, we ask two questions. Are we telling the truth? And are we standing up for the democracy and the American people? Because they have a lot of what I would just think of as convoluted tactical reasons why telling the truth and standing up for the democracy and the American people is not appropriate at this time. But those are the, two, those are the only two questions we're ever going to ask. And the idea that somehow tactically you can manipulate and fool the American people on the most important questions of the day is not one we're going to ask. Because we don't believe in asking that question. We don't believe that winning that way is winning. And we feel as if there's been enough attempt to manipulate and fool the American people. And that really what we need is to pull together across party lines and decide that we're going to stand up for our democracy and for the values that have been American for hundreds of years. Great. Thank you. Anyone else on that question before I go to the next one? So, Jennifer, uh, you, you mentioned this, but I want to zero in on it. There are lawsuits pending around the emoluments violations the President's committed. How do you address the question of why not just wait for those lawsuits to be completed or the cases to be completed before calling for impeachment proceedings on that ground? So that's a, a great question. Um, there, there are several other lawsuits. You probably maybe are aware of them. There is a lawsuit uh, that was brought in New York federal court um, by some competitors of the various Trump properties, as well as um, CRU, which is a nonprofit um, organization that uh, looks into corruption. Um, and then there is also um, a lawsuit uh, brought by 200 members, uh, Democratic members of the Congress. Um, and then there's a third lawsuit brought by D.C. and the state of Maryland. Um, and what the differences between those lawsuits um, and between what an impeachment process, they're, they're multiple, but mostly they're about the scope and the complexities of who has standing, um, who can bring these cases. So, for example, the New York case um, was, uh, New York federal court case was dismissed because the, the court said, well, these plaintiffs don't, have standing, really it's up to Congress to, to look at it. The, uh, the, the case brought by the 200 members, Democratic members of Congress, um, they just had an argument um, last month. And the, the, the story with that, though, is the remedy there that they're seeking is different than what we're talking about here. With impeachment, we're saying the president acts in a way that undermines the rule of law in violation of the Constitution, and he needs to be removed from office. Whereas what they're asking there, different types, a different type of remedy, which would relate to just seizing um, some of this activity. And then in the, in the case brought by Maryland um, and D.C., the court has um, said it can move forward. So they've, they've, they've um, gotten over that standing hurdle, but it's really narrow. It only focuses on um, emoluments, payments brought uh, to Trump through that Trump International Hotel. And we just gave you a taste of all the other foreign um, and domestic emoluments um, that, uh, that, that um, are at play here. So um, again, just to summarize some of it, it's, it's complex, it's slow, and it's much more narrow, um, and it doesn't result in the removal of the president. Uh, thank you. Uh, ben, question for you. Some commentators have said on this issue of impeachment that we will only have one opportunity uh, to build this case, and it's not the right time. It's too soon uh, to present this argument for impeachment proceedings. How do you respond to that? Well, I think par part of the answer uh, is, is what Tom said, uh, and, and that I think people need to come at this as a question of, of principle uh, and not as small ball tactics. Um, but as far as the premise of the question that, that you only have one shot at impeachment, I, I don't think that is historically accurate, and I don't think it's accurate today. I, that there were um, several efforts to impeach Richard Nixon. One of them uh, resulted in articles of impeachment and ultimately resulted in his resignation, but it didn't happen overnight. Uh, there was, much as we are seeing today, uh, a small number of Congressmen filing uh, articles, filing resolutions, a movement that built over time. Um, 
So I, I don't think the premise is accurate. And to some degree, even if you accept the premise, uh, maybe there is only one shot. But we need to start, we needed to start as we did, and I wish more people would, uh, a year and a half ago. To make it happen, it should happen as soon as possible. But even if you think it's going to take another year, it's not going to happen even in a year if we say, well, we can't do anything now. Great. Thank you. Anyone want to address that? Uh, if, if not, I think we're at the close of this session. I want to turn over to Tom for closing remarks. So, so I do want to thank the people on this panel for the work they've done over the last year and a half. Because whatever, whatever else has happened, impeachment is definitely part of the national discourse. We've changed the way people think about this president and whether, in fact, he is lawless and reckless. And I think that's happened to a large extent thanks to the people sitting up here. Um, I would also say that I agree with Ben. It took two and a half years to educate the American people about Richard Nixon. That's how long it took from the start of the Watergate proceedings to his leaving office. And over that time, people gradually came. It wasn't really until the tapes came out that we went from that 43 percent to much more than 43 percent. So there was a gradual and then a, a sudden process of people understanding, including those hearings on national TV and the Senate Judiciary Committee, where people could see, and that's the problem with shutting down the oversight by Congress and the Senate. In those days, people could watch this series of creeps go on TV and think, oh my goodness, these people are dreadful. <laughs> this is not a good situation. You know, it's a, a real soap opera in, with only villains. So it was actually a very important educational process. Um, I'd say two last things. One is the other point from Nixon that I would draw is there's never one cockroach. <laughs> when you see a president who's lawless and you can prove through the emoluments clause or through overt obstruction of justice that he's a lawbreaker, he's uh, an anti-small d Democrat, you will discover after he's gone many things that he did, as we have with Nixon, that when you don't respect the law, when you put yourself above the law, when you think you are the law, you will do horrible things throughout your presidency. And that's what we found out with Nixon. So I would say to all the people who think that you shouldn't be sitting in those seats, that it's inappropriate for us to bring up the truth, it's never inappropriate to bring up the truth. If Americans had hidden from the truth, we wouldn't be here today. And so I think it is really important for all of us to be in the tradition of Americans who stand up for the truth and justice when everyone is telling them to shut the hell up. That's what I'd say. Thank you, Tom. Thank you to our panelists, Ron Fine, Tom Steyer, Jennifer Taub, Ben Clements. Thank you to our in-person audience here in Boston and to all of you watching online all across the country. We invite you to join us at impeachmentproject.org to learn more about the legal arguments for impeachment proceedings to access our new book, The Constitution Demands It, The Case for the Impeachment of Donald Trump. And we stand ready to work with you in the defense of our Constitution and our democracy. Thank you.